Hey guys, and welcome to the interface overview for Blender. In this video, I'm going to go through every single one of the menus to sort of give you an idea of what each of them does. I'm not going to go into the settings for each one, but at the very least, you guys should get a general idea of what each tab is for and what each icon means and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get started with the menus here. This one is the render settings. This is involving anything and everything to do with when you render an image or an animation What's the output of that? What dimensions is that? You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different settings here you can play around with for the rendering. This is the render layer tab, which is used mostly for setting render layers and creating render layers. And um, this is a very important part of rendering as well in the fact that you're separating out your scene into different layers that you can render out to composite later on. Very important for compositing, but you don't have to know that as much in the beginning. This is the scene settings tab. So this goes over a lot of overarching global settings for your scene. For example, the camera, the main camera, uh, your unit presets, if you want to do degrees, metric, uh, imperial, etc. Um, you can use blender units or real units, stuff like that. There's a keying sets, color management, um, and even gravity for the, uh, the rigid body stuff. Uh, and then this tab is the world tab. This involves mostly your sky and your world lighting. You can set a sky, like an HDRI background, and those are pretty helpful. You can also do a solid color. You can also add ambient occlusion, that's where this is. And this is your object tab. So as you can see, all object specific settings are gonna be found here, and it refers to whatever object you have selected. These settings include location, rotation scale of the object, as well as the rotation mode. You also have display settings and child parent relationships. This is the Object Constraints tab, so you can actually add constraints such as copy location, copy rotation, uh, child of, uh, clamp to, stretch to, limit scale, transformation. These things are basically constraints that you can put on the object uh, that follow perhaps another object or driver of some sort. This is the Modifiers tab, and a very, very important for a lot of things. Blender is a modifier-based software. Modifiers are something that Maya doesn't have that... 3ds max and blender both have so it's a very powerful tool adding modifiers for example the mirror modifier the decimate modifier the uh, subdivision surface modifier there's a lattice deform modifier a curve modifier you know um, solidify modifier these things basically modify your mesh in some way uh, and can be very very powerful for modeling and even animation and this includes an armature modifier which is how you rig things so all that's built in as well as the cloth and uh, smoke simulations are all part of this. So so the modifiers tab is going to be very, very useful. Uh, the next tab is the data mesh tab. This talks about um, the mesh data inside of the object. And an object is an object, but what the object looks like is actually based off of the mesh data. So the mesh data includes all the vertices, the vertex groups, the shape keys, the UV maps. Um, that's all in the mesh data. And then here is the materials tab, which obviously is super important for adding materials to your object. This basically means coloring and shading and stuff like that, um, and texturing as well, which involves the texturing tab, which is linked to the materials tab in the way that this is. The texture tab can either be looking at the material textures, just the textures themselves, which includes brushes and dynamic painting, or the world textures, which involves the HDRI environment lighting maps that I talked about earlier in the world settings. And then you have the particle settings tab, which is incredibly powerful because particles are uh, a godsend in Blender. I love particles and they're very, very useful. Uh, you can just create a particle system like this, but we'll go over that later. Here is the physics tab. This involves collisions, force fields, soft body, fluid, smoke, cloth, dynamic paint, rigid body, and rigid body constraints. So this is a very, very important thing for simulations in general. Again, you don't have to memorize any of these. You don't have to know all these settings, but it's good to know what each tab is for. So I hope you guys found that helpful. For these tabs here, if you don't see the left and right uh, tabs here, you might have to press T or N, and those will close or open these tabs respectively. T is for the left side, and N is for the right side. So for the most part, the left and right sides are pretty self-explanatory. You have tools for transforming and editing and shading. You have a create tab for adding primitives. You have a relations tab for parent-child relationships and grouping. You have animation for setting keyframes. You have physics for adjusting some physics uh, settings and stuff like that. Um, and you have a grease pencil for the grease pencil, which we'll go into later. So on the right side, you have some properties like the object, location, rotation, and scale, as well as the dimensions in Blender units. 
you have some more grease pencil stuff, uh, the item name here, which is very useful, uh, as well as display for only render or not, um, as well as some shading options. And one of my favorites is probably the background images. You can add a background image this way, add an image and uh, open a file that you want. And that is also very helpful for reference and stuff like that. So we have two more panels here we haven't talked about today, which is in this default workspace. And that is the timeline and the outline. So over in the bottom here, you have the timeline, which is used for animation and stuff like that. You can actually hit Alt A and that will play it. And I went ahead and left the particle system on here from earlier just to show you guys the actual animation that's playing. And you can hit Alt A again to pause it. And you can also click and drag if you'd like to do that instead, as well as move to the beginning of the timeline with shift left arrow or the end of the timeline with shift right arrow. You can also hold alt and use the scroll wheel to go up and down the timeline, just like so. So scrolling up goes up the timeline or backwards in time, whereas scrolling down goes forward in time. So that's how you navigate the timeline. And then you have the outline, which is over here in the top right hand corner which has a hierarchy of different things you can see here that you have the scene you have the render layers of the scene and the world of the scene then you have the camera cube and lamp of the scene so these actually correspond to objects directly and you'll notice if we go ahead and zoom out here that whenever i select one of these it will actually select the object in the scene. So that's another good way to be able to find an object very easily, perhaps in a more crowded scene. Now, one more thing I wanna teach you is how to resize windows and stuff like that. It's very intuitive. You just basically click and drag the boundary there and you can resize pretty much any panel in the interface as long as you are between two separate independent panels. You can also expand these panels here um, that's entirely up to you, or you can make them smaller, it's up to you. Now, another thing you can do is you can add a panel, and it's very simple, the way you do it, is you just go to one of these corners here where it has these diagonal lines, and once you see a diagonal line there, that means if you click and drag, it will create a new panel. So as you can see, we now have two timelines here, it's duplicated, but you can click on this bottom left-hand corner icon here, which in this case is the timeline, but it's a drop-down menu, which then allows you to choose any kind of panel. So here's one that we're familiar with, the 3D view. So now we have another 3D view panel and you can actually use it just like the viewport over here and it's a separate viewport. You can also do an outliner, for example, right here. Um, but if you wanna get rid of this panel, you're saying, oh, this is a little too cluttered, I wanna get rid of it. Just go to the panel next to it and take that same diagonal line pattern there and make sure your cursor turns into a crosshair and then drag it back into that area and it should delete it. Another situation you might run into when you're manipulating the interface and adding and removing panels like this is that you might run into a situation where you have these two panels next to each other and then a longer panel spanning the length of both of them, for example, and you want to close the longer one. Now, if you want to close this timeline here, I could try to take this area and drag it down, but it doesn't work. I could try to take this guy and drag it down, but it doesn't work. And if I try to drag this one up, it just brings me another timeline. Now I can get rid of this timeline that I just made, like so. So why can I get rid of this timeline? Well, the reason is because there is one rule about removing panels, and that is the panel that you drag to remove this timeline has to share one side equally with that timeline. And unfortunately, this timeline doesn't share a side equally with any other panel. As you can see, this panel doesn't have the same length on this side, it doesn't end here. This panel ends here, this panel ends here, and the only other sides are just the border of the software. So in order to get this panel to disappear, you must first create a panel next to it that shares a side equally. Now, if you create one like this, it doesn't do you any good to delete it because you just created another one to replace it. So if you actually wanna get rid of it, you're gonna have to bring these guys over into that space. So one way to do it is kind of like a puzzle. It's sort of fun if you want to play a game out of it. All you got to do is take this guy first because you know these two share the same side here equally, right? They both start and end in the same spot. So let's go ahead and remove that. And then 
from there, now that these guys share the same side here, as you can see, the 3D viewport and the timeline share the same side. So you can actually now drag this one over just fine. So that's just something to keep in mind. A lot of people might have a little bit of trouble with the interface at first, but it's very, very simple and intuitive and kind of fun when you play around with it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And I hope you guys found this tutorial helpful.